Okay, so the second speaker of this morning session is uh, Alessio Figali from ETH Zurich. Uh, he needs no introduction, so let's start right away while we are still in time. So uh, he's going to speak about the singular set in the Stefan problem. Okay, so thank you very much. And uh, uh, I'm really, really sorry I couldn't be in Grenoble for this meeting. Um, He's, I mean, it's a fantastic event and I wished I could be there, uh, but I'm happy at least to be present virtually. So thanks for listening to me. Um, today, I would like to discuss a topic on which I've been working in the last uh, few years, which is uh, the Stefan problem. So the Stefan problem uh, is named after Stefan, but in reality, it was introduced way before Stefan by Lame and Claperon. So we are at almost 200 years ago. And uh, what they wanted to study in Amelie Claperon was to understand what happens when you have um, a temperature that evolves in time, but with the presence of a phase transition. So let's say you have ice melting into water and temperature will change in time, but you have the melting, which creates extra difficulties because of course the melting process introduces a series of new variables, in particular the interface ice water would be an unknown of our problem. So this was, in, as I said, introduced by Lamain Clapeyron, then was formalized by Stefan. And actually Stefan um, introduced a variety of problems. And so under the name of Stefan problem, there exist many, many different questions. The one I will focus on is the one phase Stefan problem. And I will explain what I mean. So let's say that my, domain, the place where things happen, it's something like that, a cylinder. So I have a box, a cylinder. I impose boundary conditions. So this means that I'm prescribing temperature. So I prescribe my temperature on the boundary of my domain. Inside my container, I have both ice and water that live together. And what happens is that the, the boundary that separates ice from water it's an unknown of the problem. So this is why we call it free boundary. It's not a prescribed boundary, but it's a boundary that will change in time and is part of the problem itself. Um, why do we call it one phase? Because we're gonna make a simplification. We are gonna assume that the temperature, so ice corresponds to temperature identically zero. So in reality, there will be only one temperature, which is the temperature of the water but inside the ice, there will be no evolution of temperature because the ice is the region where temperature is identically zero. So this is, a, the let's say, the simplest and most classical Stefan problem. Still, is a very rich problem, and that's the one I want to study. So let me introduce the, the, the setting. So I have theta, which is my temperature, is a function of position and time, t, t and x. So theta, of t and x represent the temperature at position x at time t. As I told you, I, I'm assuming I am in, one, in the one phase situation, which means that the ice has zero temperature. So one could also study more complicated models where temperature in the ice is negative, and then you will have an evolution for the temperature inside the ice. This is not what we're going to do today. Uh, instead, in the water, of course, there is evolution. So the temperature of the water is the theta positive. And inside the water, there is evolution. The temperature changes in time. So here in the water, we have the heat equation. So the heat equation is the most classical model for temperature propagation, temperature evolution, let's say. So dt of theta equal Laplacian of theta, which is the sum of the pure second derivatives. So you just sum all the second derivatives in the let's say, n directions. So this is the trace of the action of you, of the action of theta, sorry. Um, so this is the evolution of the water, but finally you need a, a, an information, and this is the Stefan condition, what we call the Stefan condition, a condition that tells you what happens at the free boundary. So the, the, the Stefan condition 
tells you that the free boundary will move in time. So if you take a particle on the free boundary, this particle will move. The particle will move inside the ice. So the ice is melting in this problem, in this problem and it can, it can only melt because te the temperature is greater or equal than zero. So since we don't have negative temperature, slightly negative temperature, there is no freezing in this dynamics. There is only melting. And uh, in this melting phenomenon, the speed at which the ice will melt, so the speed at which a free boundary point moves inside, is given by the negative of the gradient of the temperature at the interface, okay? So we have this OD condition. So just to explain this better with a picture, you can think of this, right? So here is the ice on the left. Here is the water on the right. The temperature here you see is positive in the water. You compute the gradient of the temperature at the point, at the interface. So here is the, these arrows represent the slope of, the, of theta from the side of the water. And then you flip the sign and this vector tells you um, the speed of the interface. So you see that uh, as I drew before, all the arrows here are all pointing inward inside the ice because the ice is melting. Okay, so this is the, the problem. Uh, it's a very classical problem. You see, it's a cup, we have a coupled system in some sense because there is the PD for the temperature and then there is this ODE for the free boundary. But then a miracle occurs in this problem it's a beautiful um, analytic transformation that was discovered um, kind of at the same time by Bayocchi and Duvaux. So we are around um, approximately around 1972. Uh, Bayocchi did it for a slightly different version of this problem. And then Duvaux did it exactly for the Stefan problem, but it's the same trick. Uh, the, the idea is that instead of looking at theta as a variable, we look at a new function u, which is the, the integral in time of theta, okay? So uh, essentially you just integrate it in time and this has a, a series of advantages. Well, first of all, because theta is non-negative, automatically you will be non-negative. Also, <laughs> by this formula, you, you notice that theta is simply the time derivative of u. So u is monotonically non-increasing. But then there is another fantastic fact. And this is due to the melting fact, to the fact that the ice melts and cannot freeze. So there is a direction of time. So the observation is that if theta is zero sometime, then theta is zero in the past for as less than T. In other words, if you have a point which is inside the ice at some time, it tend to be in the ice in the past because the ice is melting. So the, there is always more ice in the past than in the future. And thanks to this observation, you can check that the set u equals zero as a subset of space time is the same as theta equals zero. So if u is zero at one point, it means that the integral from zero to t of theta was zero. And so theta had to be zero in the past, but vice versa, if theta is zero at one point, theta was zero in the past, and then u is zero. So you just prove the two inclusions. Uh, and this means, this identity means that u carries all the information about the free boundary. So if you just want to understand the, the ice, the region of where the ice lives, which means also understanding the region where the water lives because it's the complement, you don't need to study u, well, you don't need to to understand theta equals zero, you can just understand u equals zero. Um, so this is a, a key fact. So very good. It means that if I'm just focusing on the on this free boundary and I want to understand the free boundary, then I have a new variable to study, a new function. What is the advantage of u now? Well, I told you that theta solves a system, solves it equation, and then there is an OD at the free boundary. Now, because u is an integral in time of theta, actually, it's more regular than theta. It's an integral, it, it regularizes. And it actually solves a PDE, but a single PDE, no OD anymore. And that's what happens. You will solve the following PDE. So what is this? So uh, characteristic 
of u positive is the function which which um, takes values one and zero, so one and zero, one if u positive, zero if u zero. And then dtu minus Laplacian of u, so the heat equation applied to u is not zero anymore. There is a source term that comes really from the, the melting of ice to water, and it's minus the characteristic of u positive. Um, so here, there is a very nice thing. So there is a single PD now for you. Everything is inside this PD. And in part, but U is more regular than theta. And the reason here is kind of a, um, a PD reason. Because if here you notice that uh, this function is bounded, so this is an L-infinity function is bounded because it's a function which takes the characteristic function is a function that takes values zero and one, so in particular it's bounded. Then if you know that you solve the heat equation with a bounded right-hand side, automatically your function u will be C1 in space. Um, and this is different than theta because if you remember theta, the picture I showed you before, there was an angle at the interface ice water, theta was making a corner. And, but you cannot do that because U has to be C1. So it means that U, if let's say this is again, ice and water, U will look more like zero on the ice and then something like this in the water. It has to grow up nicely with zero gradient at this point because it's a non-negative function. So a C1 negative function has zero gradient at the minimum. Um, so U is more regular. So let me resummarize everything in the picture. So here is what happens. U equals zero is my ice. It's the same as theta equals zero. Outside the ice, in U positive, this is the water. U solves a heat equation with right-hand side minus one. On the free boundary, the gradient of U is zero because U is C1. So the only way it can approach zero is with zero gradient. And then, well, where U is zero, Okay, it solves uh, DTU minus Laplacian U equals zero, but it's better, it's zero. So for U is zero, U is zero. There is no need to, of telling that there is a PD. Uh, but this is the situation now. So we have a single PD, which may look surprising at the first, at first sight, right? Because you will say, well, but wait, there was a Stefan condition. Where is the Stefan condition? The Stefan condition now is hidden. It's hidden because at this point on the free boundary, here, you know that u is zero and grad u is zero. So you have two conditions for you, which is something unusual in PDEs. So when you solve the heat equation, you can prescribe something for the function. This is like u equals zero. This would be like the Dirichlet problem, but then you are not allowed to prescribe the gradient as well. So the fact that here you are prescribing both functions and gradient, both function and gradient, uh, is an overdetermined problem. And this in, in implicitly governs the evolution of the ice. So the ice has to melt in such a way that at every instant of time, both you and the gradient vanish. So it is in this overdetermined problem that there is hidden the evolution of the ice. Uh, it may look complicated, but in fact, it's much nicer now because we have a single nice PD with bounded right hand side. Actually, it has a lot of nice properties. You can prove existence uniqueness, stability, everything you want about this PD. So this PD is actually extremely nice. There is, there is a classical theory that allows you to do all the basic properties. So the real challenge is not to prove existence, uniqueness, anything about this evolution, is to understand the fine properties of the solution. In particular, we want to understand the free boundary because you it by itself is not the unknown. Our unknown was the, the temperature. That's the one we're interested in. Uh, U is a kind of an artificial variable, an artificial function that now allows us to study the problem. But then again, our goal is the, the free boundary, which means let's understand U equals zero. Okay, so we're gonna start. To study U equals zero, in fact, uh, the first thing you need really to do is to first study the regularity of U. So usually they go together. I mean, if you want to study a free boundary problem uh, for some PDE, First, you understand the function, and then you understand the, the, the interface, the, the boundary of U positive. So this is, the again, the, the interface ice water. So you start with question one, regularity of U. 
And once you understand that, you go to question two, regulator of the interface. So let's start with question one. Um, question one, there are several results. And actually, the question one was very well understood already um, now fifth, more than 50 years ago. And this is the result. U is going to be C1 in time and C11 in space. OK, so this means what? This means that DTU exists and DTU is a continuous function. And the action of U exists. And C11 means that the action of U is bounded. OK? So the action is not continuous. It's only bounded, the action in space. Now, um, this is optimal. So this result is optimal. And for that, you can see it very quickly, because remember the PD. The PD is DTU minus Laplacian of U, which is the trace of the action of U, um, is equal to minus the characteristic of U positive. And this is not a continuous function. The characteristic of U positive is a function which has a jump, jumps from zero to one. So the sum of this term and this term is bounded, but not continuous. And now once I tell you, once you prove that this one is continuous, well, this one then cannot be continuous. So the Laplacian is not continuous. In particular, the Hessian cannot be continuous either. So the best you can hope for, for the Hessian in this, from this relation, is to hope that is bounded. But more than bounded, you cannot hope, because if it were continuous, then you will get a contradiction. So this is actually the optimal regularity you, you can hope for. Um, and this is by now well known. Now, what about then the free boundary? So you understand you. Let's look a moment at the interface. So the interface, uh, there has been, a, first of all, a very important result by Kinderler and Nirenberg in 77 that said, well, if the free boundary is a C1, then in fact, it's smooth, it's infinity. Even better, it's analytic. Um, what do I mean by C1? By C1, it is the following. Assume that there is a point on the free boundary and a ball, and you have, well, the free boundary lives in space time. So I should draw this in space time. Uh, let me do it just in space because it's difficult to do pictures in space time. So let's think for a moment just fixed time, but in reality, it should be in, face, in space time. Um, so you have a point on the free boundary, you have a, a neighborhood, and inside this neighborhood, you have a, you assume that there exists a C1 surface such that U is zero here and U is positive on the other side, okay? So by C1, I mean it's a C1 upper surface that separates U positive from U zero. If you have a C1 upper surface, then in reality, this upper surface has to be C infinity and actually analytic. So the difficulty is, can it say that the surface that separates ice from water is C1? When, can I say? How often? Is it true? Um, this was a big open problem, and a, a fundamental contribution to this was given by Caffarelli in 77. Caffarelli proved that the free boundary is C1 up to sub singular points. So, this uh, C1 assumption, as I told you, this upper surface that separates happens at many points. We will discuss this up to some singular points. So, there are points where things go badly, and these will be singular points, and these singular points exist. So let's try to analyze a bit this and to discuss what, what Caffarelli did, because this will be the starting point for us. Um, so what Caffarelli did is the following. What the idea of the proof of Caffarelli was is a blow up technique. What does it mean? It means the following. Fix a free boundary point, let's say the origin, zero, zero in space time. And now you have your function u, which is defined in a neighborhood, let's say in a small ball around the origin, and you zoom, so you, you transform your ball, in reality, your cylinder, this, is, this should be a, like a parabolic cylinder, so this, in reality, it should be the set BR in space cross 
uh, let's say, uh, minus r square r square in time. So this is the natural scaling when you zoom uh, in for a parabolic equation, because you see here, time and space don't scale the same. There is an r in x and r square in t to be consistent with the PD for, for the equation. Uh, but let's say you can think of time frozen for a moment. So you are you look at BR and you zoom in, you make it B1, scale one. Of course, your function will scale with it. And that's the natural scaling. Why is it the natural scaling? Because if you rescale time with R square, you rescale space with R and you divide by R square, then DTUR minus Laplacian UR is equal to minus characteristic of UR positive. So this is the scaling that preserves the equation. So if you rescale with small r and you just zoom, is you're like zooming in, instead of having a, the function u defined in a small ball, you have a family of functions you are defined as scale one, all as scale one, and they are all solutions to our equation. Um, okay, and then you say, so these functions you are are capturing the behavior of u in a small ball br or in, in a cylinder here. I will call this QR in a small cylinder QR. And uh, um, which means that if I can understand the behavior of UR as R goes to zero, I can understand the behavior of U in a small neighborhood of the origin. So the blob technique is the following. Say, let's rescale these functions and let's prove that these functions are compact, the functions UR, so that I can take a limit. You find an accumulation point, Maybe there are more, there is more than one. Maybe there are many accumulation points. You find them, you just say they exist by compactness. This is abstract. And the goal is to classify them. So, so accumulation, this is what we call blow up. A blow up is a possible accumulation point of our functions you are. As I say, they may not be unique. And then you want to classify them. And the hope is that if I can classify all possible blow ups, then perhaps I can transfer the information back to my function u, right? So if I know all possible asymptotic behaviors of u infinitesimally, then maybe I can say something about the function itself. So classifying blow ups, so doing blow up by itself is easy. It's just abstract compactness. It's not very challenging this part. The difficulty in general is always to classify blow ups. This is in any problem where you do blow up techniques, that's one of the main challenges. Then there may be more, but this is one main challenge. Um, so before discussing the theorem of Caffarelli, let me just do some heuristic. So what are the possible blow-ups that I can expect to see? Well, you could say the following. Let's assume that I am already near a nice point. So let's assume like in this picture that I have u positive on one side, u zero on the other side, and a nice upper surface in between. Well, then what I expect is that my function will look something like in the one in the picture. It will be zero on one side, and then it grows nicely on the other side. And here there is this surface, which is my free boundary, right? But this surface, let's assume that is smooth. Then as you zoom in, as you look closer and closer, the surface will, in the limit, will become a hyperplane. It will just converge to its tangent plane. So it will get flatter and flatter. So in the limit, I expect to see something like this. I expect to see this surface that has become a hyperplane. The hyperplane will be orthogonal to some direction E. And then it, since I have a hyperplane, I have on one side, I have zero. So I will have zero on a half space. And then in the opposite space, the opposite side, U is positive here. The limit of U is positive. And because it's a hyperplane, I expect to have a, a translation invariance in the upper plane direction. So morally in the limit, I don't expect to have any dependence on the directions of the upper plane. I only expect to have dependence in the direction orthogonal. So in the limit, I expect to see a 1D profile, a function which depends only on one variable. And then if you solve the PD in one dimension, it becomes an ODE, it's explicit the solution. The solution is a half parabola. So this u here will look like one half e dot x square, where e is a is a is a unit vector. So if you take this, you can check that this is a solution to the problem, it's a stationary solution of the problem. And that's what you would expect to see. 
uh, if you were at a nice interface problem. Okay, so if the interface is nice, I expect to see something like that. So now I'm gonna do reverse engineering. I'm gonna say, well, by definition, I will tell you that a free boundary point is a regular point if the solution rescaled converge to this, what I call half space, this is a half space solution. Half space solutions, because the zero set is half space. Um, so this is a definition so far. So this is what we expect to see at nice points. What, what else could it happen? Well, you know, I could think of the following case now, that U is positive here, and then the ice is very thin around the origin, okay? So just think of ice that is melting, and at some moment it becomes something very thin around the origin. Then my function U will probably look something like that. In the limit, as I zoom in, this, uh, this set will become flatter and flatter around a plane. And I expect to see in the limit something like a parabola, like one half e dot x squared. So this, is of, this will be like a 2D situation in this picture. So this is what I expect to see when the ice is super thin around the origin. As I zoom in, I see less and less ice. And then in the limit, there is no real ice. There is just a line of where u is zero. So it's like ice is disappearing there, right? It, it, has, it has no measure. Of course, there is still philosophically some ice because u equals zero is there, but it's physically artificial ice, okay? It has no measure. There is no real ice. Uh, this is only in 2D. You could do this in every dimension, these kind of pictures. And you can build the different kind of ices, right? You could do something like this. The ice is like, a, uh, it has a, it looks like a, a very thin around one axis. Or perhaps the ice could be more like, um, like a, a, more, a product of the picture I just did in three dimension. So the ice could look like, uh, essentially the product of what I did in 2D times a third variable, right? So it looks more like a plane. Uh, the, so it's like a very, it's collapsing to a plane rather than to, an, to a line. This is in 3D. In higher dimension, you have more variables. So if you just do a bit of abstraction and you think what are all the options, you think that, well, in reality, I could get any polynomial with some constraints. So I will say that zero, zero is a singular point. If when I zoom in, my solution will converge to a quadratic polynomial. You will always get something quadratic because the, the, the scaling is quadratic. You see, I'm dividing by Rx over R square. So you expect to see something quadratic. Um, this polynomial is of the form one half AXX. So A is a matrix, uh, symmetric. You can assume to be symmetric, otherwise symmetrized. Um, but you see, U is non negative, remember? So because U is non negative, this polynomial is non negative. And so here you see that the matrix A should be non-negative definite. Also, in, inside the water, remember, DTU minus Laplace U is equal to minus one. Now, in the limit, again, this polynomial is static. There is no time. So in the limit, what do you expect? You expect DTP2 minus Laplace P2 equal minus one, but there is no time. So Laplace P2 minus Laplace and P2 equal minus one. So Laplace and P2 is one. And so this gives trace of A equal one. So every polynomial of this form with A non-negative and trace one is a, sol is a stationary solution to the Stefan problem. And this is, these are all the solutions you expect to see if your ice is disappearing in the limit. So these are the singular points. And so far, these are definitions again. No one tells me that, you know, I have convergence. No one tells me that there are no other options. Well, by now someone tells me that, and you will see this in a second. Just to give you again an example, the, I drew this picture. So you see if the eyes look something like this in three dimension, uh, so this is like a ice that is collapsing around this plane. Let's say that this plane is X2 equals zero. And then the polynomial associated to this would be one half x2 square. This is the only polynomial which is non-negative definite, trace one, 
and vanishes on x2 equals zero. Or the ice could look something like this around an axis. Uh, and then here, so the, there will be a polynomial. Sorry, the, the line was not very straight. Uh, so you have this line, which is x1 equal x2 equal zero. And now you have a polynomial which has to be vanishing on this line and uh, trace one. It could be this one, but that's only an example because there are many polynomials now that, uh, that satisfy my two constraints. So this is, a, the, the polynomial I wrote is the one which is totally symmetric in X1 and X2, but perhaps it could be different. You could have different coefficients for X1 squared and X2 squared. Uh, but this was just to give you a couple of examples. So you see the polynomial is capturing the geometry of the ice. The, poly, the zero set of the polynomial here, in the first polynomial, the zero set is X2 equals zero. So the ice looks like two dimensional. In this case, the second example, the polynomial, the zero set of the polynomial is a, is a line. And in fact, the ice looks like one dimensional around the, the free boundary point. Um, okay. So what is the theorem? So Caffarelli proved a fundamental dichotomy. So let me denote again by QR, the parabolic cylinder. So the ball in R and R square in, in time. Uh, then, the theorem and stating is a combination of what Caffarelli proved in 77 plus something he discovered in 98. Uh, to be honest, the one in 98 is in the elliptic case, so it's not Stefan, but then it was easily generalized later to the Stefan. So I just cite these two papers now. I will give more evidence later. Uh, so the, the, the fundamental dichotomy of Caffarelli is the following. Fix a free boundary point, then you have only two options. Either the point is regular, which means you converge to a half space solution. And so that's a very weak information. You just say that if you zoom in, in the limit, you'll see a half space. But in that case, the free boundary is analytic in a neighborhood. So every time in the limit, at one point, you see a half space. In reality, in a neighborhood, your free boundary was super nice. So this is the regular part of the free boundary. Otherwise, it could be that the point is singular. That's the other option. In which case, the free boundary is trapped near a, a hyperplane. And with a picture, I'm gonna show it to you. So option one is this regular point. Option two, you see there is, uh, uh, the hyper, you look at the hyperplane, uh, this is E dot X equals zero. And the free boundary is trapped in a little of a neighborhood of this hyperplane when you look everything at scale R, okay? Um, so this is option two. So of course, the result is extremely satisfactory here in the singular case, in the regular case. It says, okay, if at one point I'm regular, I'm analytic in a neighborhood, very strong. At the singular points, it's extremely interesting still. It tells you how the ice is collapsing, but it's not very precise. It's just telling us, okay, the ice has to collapse around a uh, hyperplane. That's it. So now the goal for us will be to focus on singular points. Can we improve this description? Regular points are analytic. So there is a part of the free boundary which is made of analytic points. And then we want to understand the singular part. So I'm gonna introduce some notation. So I have sigma is the set of all singular points. And then sigma t is the set of singular points that I see at time t. Let me try to explain this. Um, let's, say, let's fix a time t. So fix t. And let's assume that the ice looks like this. So again, the ice, remember the ice could artificially contain some lines because let's say that the ice just one millisecond before looked like this. So this could have been the ice. So this is a time t minus epsilon. And then at time t, I could see this. All of this. So this is my set u equals zero. Okay, this is my ice. Um, okay, so this part of the boundary, every point here, this is regular because on one side, I have the water, on the other side, I see the ice. But every point here on this segment is singular. 
So this will be my set sigma t. At time t, my set sigma t is this segment. And my regular part is the boundary of these two kind of uh, drops that I drew. Uh, so this is a 2D example. Let's say these are in 2D. And this is very interesting, this example, because it shows something. Look, the regular free boundary, so the let's say I have boundary of u positive, is a union of a time t. Sorry, I should have said a time t here. In this example, if I look at this part of the picture, the boundary of ut positive is the union of regular at time t and sigma at time t. And both the regular part and the singular part, these two sets are 1D curves. Right? So the regular part is this part of the, the boundary of these drops, and the singular part is all segment. So the singular set and the regular set are uh, the same size. They're both one dimensional object. So first warning is not true that the singular points are smaller than the regular points. I could have this picture where I see as many singular points as regular points. So that's kind of bad, right? So this is the, the bad news. Uh, but okay, now instead, what I'm gonna, but I all, all, I'm also focusing now on the set of all singular points, right? So I look at the set of all singular points. This is a subset of space and time. So it's the union over time of all these singular sets. What can we say? Well, if you, uh, there have been many contributions first by uh, Caffarelli 98, then by uh, Blanchet 2006, and then more results by Lindgren and Monod 2015. What they proved is that sigma t, so for every time, sigma t is contained in a C1 n minus one dimensional manifold. Uh, notice that this is optimal because what I just showed you, I showed you an example in two dimension where sigma t is a line. Uh, if you are in higher dimension, I could have done the same example with an n minus one dimensional surface. So for every t, you know that the regular points are an n minus one dimensional analytic manifold. And then there are the singular points which are contained in a C1 n minus one dimensional manifold. So this is optimal in terms of dimension, this n minus one. Also, if you look at sigma as a subset of space and time, this will be C1 in space and then C1 half in time. So it's like half regularity. And that's also natural because you remember the scaling. Space and time scale differently. There is a R and R square. So every regularity in space gives half regularity in time. So this is to say something like this, right? So you have to think that I have space here, I have time here, and then I have my eyes. So the eyes will be in space time, will be a graph because it's melting. So this will be my set u equals zero in space time. And then there will be singular points here and there. Let me draw them. Maybe so singular points are all maybe points here. I draw them as points, but of course they could be surfaces. So these are my, this is sigma. The, so I have this graph in space time. So this is u equals zero as a set of space time, which is melting. So it gets smaller and smaller. The boundary of this graph is the time where you pass from u zero to u positive. So it's the transition ice um, from ice to water. If you intersect this uh, epograph of u equals zero with t, with a slice t, you see the ice at time t. So for each time, I don't know if I look at this, this would be ice at time t. the slice, and singular points are somewhere on the boundary, okay? And as a subset of space and time, they are C1 in space and C1 half in time, which is not great. Uh, I mean, uh, the Brownian motion is C1 half in time. I mean, so, you know, C1 half in time is not a super regularity. Um, so this is what was known until 2015 about the singular points. Now, can we say something better? Okay, just keep in mind that this n minus one dimensional information is optimal. So for each t, the fact that you are, can be n minus one dimensional is optimal. Okay, so now 
we want to understand better the singular points, let's look at them as a subset of space and time, okay? Uh, so we want to understand how large it is. To understand the singular points, what you can do is to define a distance, the parabolic distance, so that this is like a, a square root of modulus of t prime minus t plus x prime minus x square is a distance in uh, space time. And it's called parabolic distance because it's the natural distance for parabolic, right? So for in, in x, it behaves like the usual Euclidean distance, but in time is a square root of time. Uh, with this distance, you have to think that you have r cross rn, space and time. This has dimension n, but this has dimension two. So the time has dimension two for this distance because of the square root. So the whole space time in which the everything believes for this distance, if you define the out of measure, the out of dimension for this distance, you will have dimension n plus two. And now for this distance, if you look at the dimension of the singular set in space time, this is n plus one half, which, okay, is a number, but it's not so small, n plus one half. So this is what you get if you just combine what I just told you. So you know that for each t, you have n minus one dimensional objects. Then you have this older regularity in time. You combine these two and you get this information. Is it optimal? Not at all. What we proved uh, with the Rossoton and Serra is that the, the dimension of sigma is m minus one. And this is optimal. Actually, it could be surprising. Why? Because sigma is the uncountable union of all the sigma t. So for each t, you have the singular set. And you know that these objects are n minus one dimension. And now you do an uncountable union of them and you still get n minus one. It hasn't increased. How is that possible? Well, the answer is actually natural if you think about it. What does it mean this? It means that, okay, perhaps for some times I will see n minus one dimensional objects, but it's very rare to see them. So hidden in this theorem, there is much more. It's telling you, well, the, the set of times where you can see a lot of singular sets, so the singular set is large, in reality is extremely rare in time. It has dimension zero. And you can see this back in my picture. Think of this. Um, you see in the past here, all points are regular. On the left in t, time t minus epsilon, the, the points have, haven't collapsed yet. There is no singular set. Then here in my picture to the right, there is singular set up appearing, fine but it's one instant of time. And if you go in the future, so if now you move up in the future, what you will see that the line will disappear because it's melting. And then in reality, we just see two disconnected components here and here. These disconnected components come from here and this comes from here. So you see that the, it's true that you can see singular sets which are large, but they're extremely rare in time. In general, you don't expect them to survive. And this is what this theorem, this very precise estimate tells you. This tells you a lot, many, it's more quantitative, but it tells you something very precise and is optimal. Okay, so this is about the, the total dimension, but can we say something better? Can we analyze even better how the free boundary looks like around singular points? Yes, we can. We can actually pr provide a very precise structure theorem for sigma. Actually. I should say even more precise than I would have expected when we started this project in 2018. So 17, 18. Um, so what we proved is the following, there are several theorems, but let me state just some key result. First of all, so you have the set of singular points. In this set of singular points, which live in space time, okay, in reality, you cannot understand all of them in very, in a super precise set. So we will have to say, okay, I can understand all of them up to small measure. So I tell you, okay, take this set sigma, which lives in space time. There exists a subset sigma infinity, such that this is true. The co-dimension of sigma infinity inside sigma is n minus two. So this, uh, this set, so this means in some sense, sigma infinity is almost full 
in sigma. So most points of sigma are going to be in sigma infinity. You will see not all of them, and I will explain you some which are not. But most of them are going to be, so most of sigma is made of points of sigma infinity. From the dimension point of view, almost all of them. Is, this is called dimension one. Um, and what happens at sigma infinity? Something extremely strong. Every time I have a point in sigma infinity, then I can write down a Taylor expansion of my solution up to every order. So there exist, and I will describe this with a picture, there exist for you, I can write it as a sum of one Taylor expansion and another Taylor expansion up to higher order terms, well, a capital O, where I have polynomials. So what is this expansion? What does it mean? The picture is the following. Let me do it perhaps in the, here in the previous one. So let's say, let me do it in one dimension because in 1D, this, th this theorem is trivial. <laughs> And the difficulty is to do it in higher dimension. So you have space and time. And what's happening? The, let's say that he, this is a, a singular point. This means that the ice is melting. And so there are, in one dimension, you will have ice melting here, right? This is ice. And then the two fronts of the ice meet at the origin. Okay, in one dimension, you see that, you know, uh, once you have a point in the ice, this goes in the past. And this is disconnecting right to, to left. So in one dimension, what happens here, uh, here, and what happens here, it's some sense, um, it's completely, um, there is no influence. So in one dimension, because a point can disconnect, what happens to the water to the right and what happens to the water to the left of the ice, is in the, they're independent one to another. So here, on the right, the water is evolving by heat equation. So it's super nice. And it doesn't, you see, until the last second, so here, as I move along the free boundary, until the very last second when I hit the other front, well, I didn't know I was a singular point. Until the very last second, it's only at the, at the last second that I realized that there is another front coming. But until I don't see it, it's like if I was moving by myself, extremely nice. There is no, nothing that could, tell me that ice is coming. So in this region here, you as a infinite expansion on this region. Of course, there is an interface, right? So uh, it's not that you match is infinity. So you have a, a jump of you from one side to another, but I can write a infinite expansion of you in this set and I can tell you exactly how it, it glues. So here you will have, in my formula, I wrote that u of tx on the right is like one half. And then I wrote, let me just show you again, e dot x in one dimension, in one direction, dimension is only x1. And then there is a b plus t. So it would be like x1 plus b1, d plus t uh, plus polynomials square positive part. So this v plus and v minus, they represent the speed of these two lines, the slope of these two lines and meet. So you see there is a positive part square, which tells you that u to the left, so where this formula is negative, you get zero, but where this formula is positive, it goes like a parabola. And here I have a very precise expansion, but then I have also the one on the other side. So I have plus one half and then another formula, which represents this part. So I have two infinite expansions on both sides, very precise. And then at the last second, when the two meet, well, they met, okay. And then suddenly I, I start, I mean, then they, it, this point became singular. But you see, it's a singular point which didn't know to be singular until the very last second. There was nothing that could make understand that it was getting singular. This is in 1D, because in 1D points disconnect. In, so doing this in higher dimension is extremely more complicated because in higher dimension, and there is nothing like this. The topology of higher dimension is not the topology of the line. Still, at most points, we can say, we can still prove that the behavior is the same. So what's happening at most points is that there will be two fronts meeting. At one moment, they will touch. In reality, these two fronts could be more complicated. These two fronts could meet, but they could have holes in them. So it's not that the ice is just two blocks. Maybe the ice is something, is a block, with holes in it that I cannot control. But at most points, most points are in sigma infinity. So the, the, when the two blocks touch, 
I have an expansion to the right and I have an expansion to the left of my block as if the block was disconnecting right to left. Although I can, it will not happen that is disconnected, but it behaves as if it was disconnected. So I have a very precise understanding of the solution on both sides. And now these polynomials Q plus and Q minus that you see in this expansion, they control all the curvature of the free boundary. So if you keep going on, like the first polynomial you write will, the, will tell you the curvature of the free boundary from the right, curvature from the left. As you keep going, you will get all the uh, next order expansion of, the, so you can write like a Taylor expansion of the free boundary at every order. So curvature is like uh, the, the surface at order two, but then you can write also how the surface behave at order three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You can go as, as long as you want. Now, not all points are of this form. And we have a very clean example of points which are not. What about other points? Well, I told you already, remember this example, this one, this is T minus epsilon, let's say. And then in the limit, you get something like this. So like a ice that is melting around a, an axis, a line. In this case, it's not true that the, until the last second, the singular point didn't realize that he was singular because as, as the ice become thinner and thinner, well, you see here, here there is water all around, right? All around the ice. So the water can see each other. An axis doesn't disconnect that tree. So because I can see around, the water feels the presence of all the water around the, the axis. And so it's not true that until the last second, I don't have, I don't realize that I'm getting singular. Actually, I feel it a lot because I'm getting more and more water coming from around uh, the ice. And so at this point, oops, sorry, this point for sure will be not in sigma infinity. There's nothing to do with sigma infinity. There is no right and left. What can we say about these points? Actually, these points are the opposite of sigma infinity. So if you, if you remember what I told you, singular points are, um, have this, when you blow up singular points, you see a quadratic polynomial. Okay, that's Caffarelli. Okay, then at most points, so here I will start to be a bit more vague. So you have sigma infinity, and then you look at the complement. And inside the complement, you have a lot of other points. But in that, inside these points, we can say many things. And in particular, it will be one set sigma prime, which represent this, uh, this one dimensional picture that I, I told you. These are the points of this, of like 1D, uh, the, the, where, the ax, where the ice is like an axis, look like this. And at these points, what happens is the following, that U behaves like a quadratic polynomial. So there exists a matrix with rank at least two. Rank two means exactly that, uh, you know, the, the matrix has to vanish on a, at least on a codimension two set. Um, where you have a, a little o of x squared plus t, but you, but you see, if you put any higher power here, two plus epsilon or one plus epsilon, this is false, but not this. So U behaves like a quadratic polynomial with a little o. So this is like a Taylor expansion, Taylor of order two, two in x, one in t. Right? So I have a Taylor expansion of my solution of order two in X and of order one in T, but any one, if you try to say, oh, but the error in the Taylor expansion is not just a little of X square, is a capital O of, of X square plus two epsilon, any epsilon, that's false. So the solution is C2, but not C2 plus epsilon for any epsilon, okay? So it's a complete paradigm with respect to sigma infinity where you have a, a sort of infinity behavior. Here are all these points, the presence of the water that turns around the axis is so strong that the solution completely loses regularity. It can be only C2 as Caffarelli proved, but nothing more. Still, this is an extremely important information to analyze how the solution grows together. And now let me conclude. What can we say about that? So I told you the previous theorem, which was very, general, dimension of the singular set bounded by n minus one. Actually, we can say what much more. So sigma infinity 
which is most of the singular set, is covered by countably many m minus one dimensional C infinity manifolds. So most of the free boundary is not only covered by C1 manifolds, as in the theorem by Caffarelli, Blanchet, um, um, and Monod, and Lindgren. It's actually covered by C infinity manifolds in space time. So you have a super nice manifold that cover all the singular set, sigma infinity. Then of course there are other points and the other points you cannot cover them with anything better than C1 because I told you that other points actually have all this singularity. I told you this, U is C2 but not C2 plus epsilon. Fine, but we can say things about how often, so the question is this, right? So you have this X and T, you have your free boundary here, U equals zero, and then you have your singular points here and there. I don't know, somewhere. And now you ask yourself, okay, here I have my singular points. Let's ask ourselves how often I see them. So let's project them in time, okay? To understand how often, for how, my, how often in time I see singular points. Okay, so if I define P to be the projection in time, then sigma infinity is totally rare. It has zero dimension. Okay, so the set of time for which I see sigma infinity has dimension zero. So no measure zero, dimension zero. So almost countable. It's not countable, but close to that. Um, about sigma prime, the set of the, you remember this set, when it, you look how often you see it, you see dimension m minus two over two. That's what it is. You cannot do better there. And then actually, for almost every time, sigma t has co-dimension four. So this is actually much stronger than what I told you before. And it, it's actually in the spirit of what I told you. I told you, oh, okay, maybe sometimes you see, so remember the bound is that sigma t is bounded by m minus one, that's the optimal bound. But in reality, for almost every time, you can put m minus four. So in reality, sigma t is much smaller than the regular part. Remember regular, at time t is m minus one dimensional. It's an m minus one dimensional analytic surface. So for most time, in reality, the singular points are co-dimension three in the regular points. Not always, but most of the time. And now this is general, this is in arbitrary dimension. Then you could say, okay, but let's specify this in dimension, in the physical dimension at most either, I don't know, two or three. We live in three dimension. You can also look at the two dimensional situation where you have like a planar situation. So let's take n at either two or three. And then in two or three, uh, well, this n minus four is zero, but in particular, this n minus two over two is less than one. And this is when it's interesting because then it tells you that if you take the seven problem, the free boundary is gonna be analytic up to a set of times, the singular times, which have dimension n minus two over two, so this means uh, zero if n equal two and one half is n equal three. So this tell you, okay, the set of times where you see singular points is extremely small. It has very small out of dimension. Um, okay, that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, I uh, thank you very much for the attention. So, uh, thank you. Ah, okay, just one thing, but that's, this is a singular point, you see, it's creating here. Singular point. So singular points exist. You can see it in this picture. Any, so thank you very much. Thanks for the talk. Uh, any questions from the audience? We have one. What's the generic behavior in terms of you? The generic behavior in terms of you? Yeah, I mean, if I pick the generic you, what? kind of singular set, initial condition, and then, you know, what I expect. Yeah. Well, so um, in fact, you expect to see everything, right? Because if you start from any block of ice, I mean, even if you take a con an initial condition, you perturb it a bit, yeah. this will not gonna change the fact that you will see singular points happening. As you can see, for instance, you take this picture now on my screen, right? Where you have this stalactite this stalactite which is going to melt into a singular point. Even if you perturb a bit this initial condition, here you will see a singular point, this is regular, and 
I mean, I think you'd expect to only see that kind of singular point in, in dimension three, not a, a plane of singularities. Plane of singularities, right. So the plane of singularity are the most unstable one. This is sigma infinity. So these are the points where uh, you could ask, so these, okay, can you kill them with genericity? I'm not sure. What is true, and this is, and this is your right, that they are the most unstable one, and that's why they have dimension zero, okay? So this kind of situation where you see almost two fronts, um, these are the one most unlikely to happen in reality. And I completely agree, and probably it could be possible to rule out this if you, generically do something. So we did something again with Rosoton and Sarah about genericity, but it was for the static case. So we did uh, um, we did prove that if you take the elliptic problem, not the parabolic one, so the same as my setting, but in the elliptic case, and you perturb the boundary condition for the Dirichlet problem in the elliptic, then in the up to dimension four, you can, the singular points never occur. So you can destroy all of them. In, the, in Stefan, you know that they will appear. I agree with you that the most, the, the difficult one are the stalactites, which are the, exactly the ones that uh, give the, this problem in the abstract dimension. Um, perhaps the other, could, one could try to hope that they don't appear. Um, let's say that overall, uh, the point is that, yeah, there is sigma infinity, there is sigma prime, there is, could be technically other stuff because, you know, we cannot really characterize the whole free boundary. We're gonna keep characterizing the free boundary up to co-dimension sets, up to lower co-dimension. So there are points which are more rare than sigma infinity with two blocks, uh, but uh, it's not so easy to prove that they disappear because we, we cannot really characterize all of them, right? In dimension four and higher, we cannot tell you if there are actually other points more robust. But for sure, maybe sigma infinity is possible to rule out. Um, the, to do something very precise generically, one would need to have a complete understanding of the free boundary at every point, which so far uh, is not even clear in dimension two, because we cannot characterize all blobs in dimension two, actually. So we can only do it up to lower co-dimension and stuff. Uh, but it's a very interesting question. Thanks. Any other question? Actually, I have one uh, question from curiosity. Do you have something yep. like lower bounds for the sigma infinity? Like if it's non-empty, it has to actually look like a manifold or like that it's locally connected or something like that? Uh, well, so no, in general, you cannot do anything about that. So you can build examples. Okay, let, let me say something. Here I cheated one second in the sense that I put minus one in the right hand side. So this minus one, it's in this minus one is even a sort of analyticity, okay? Now as an analyst and PD person, we don't lie too much where in reality things are depending on analyticity. So our, our theory is very robust and it will work even if you don't have exactly minus one, okay? Now, the moment you accept that, you know, you could perturb a bit the data, like put its infinity boundary conditions and influence a bit the, the, the dynamics so that you're not fully analytic um, because analytic is special. Then you can build examples of singular set where the singular set sigma infinity could be like uh, a counter set in, inside a infinity manifold. Okay, so I, I, I can just build by end by running a bit backward the heat equation I can build by end a sigma infinity where in some sense, the picture will be something like, you know, I have a drop and then I start to do another drop and another one. I have a line. So my line, my sigma infinity will be contained in a line and my regular set of eyes will be, a, a, I do a, you know, a countable union of stuff like this. And then the complement, after I do all these small drops, smaller and smaller, the complement will be my singular set. I can make it a counter set. So in general, sigma infinity, so the fact it's covered, but nothing more, it's optimal because uh, uh, sigma infinity could, uh, even in the elliptic case, could be a counter set. And that's the optimal thing you can hope for. So that's also why it's so delicate, this thing that when I told you, they're almost separated. They look like separated, right and left, 
but they're not really separated right and left. You could have a lot of cantors type structure appearing actually. Still, you get this symphony expansion. Okay, well, thanks again for your nice talk. Thank you very much for your uh, listening. Thank you.